Hello, good morning Hello. and welcome to the Shamble Stay at Home Festival and uh, I'll tell you straight away uh, who's on. Sorry we're a little bit late, uh, we seem to have lost Katie Brown somewhere. She may be on, she may not be on. Enjoy the kind of Beckett play involvement of uh, that scenario. Uh, we also have uh, Kerry Pritchard-McLean who you will know, uh, and she won an enormous number of uh, awards for both her, her stand-up and also being a, a, a compare as well, which is of course part of being a stand-up as well with a, uh, a separate skill. Um, this Isn't that the funniest thing when people like to go... Hey, you're such a good compare. You should try being a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> if... That's um, normally why most compares give up in the end being compares is because they're so bored of finding themselves, you know, on the escalator as they leave it, leave it a, 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 gig. a gig, you know, going going down the tube. Go, yeah, I thought you were really funny. You, you're pretty much as good as that that guy. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right. Um, and we also have um, one of my, I would say, one of my first kind of favourite live acts, really, um, who is uh, John Hegley, who the 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 brilliant poet and, and performer and uh, someone who has invited guillemots into the world of so many children as well. That's one of my, uh, I, I took my son to see uh, John when he was playing in, in, in Brighton and uh, he, he's done many, many other songs and uh, and dances with string and so many things. Uh, but the, the guillemot one, that really, that, that, that stuck in his head and it was, it, it was wonderful. How are you, also Joseph? Well, I was, well, thinking, I was thinking about, about the news uh, last night that the Edinburgh Festival isn't going ahead and how strange that is and how like just odd to think that it's the first time in my entire lifetime that that's not happened. Um, and also just the fact that John Hegley's shows to me are like my favourite memories of Edinburgh going in and watching, especially sort of when they're 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the morning. And uh, Morning? Yes. <laughs> the, yeah. Although when I say 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the morning, I just start thinking about late nights in Edinburgh, so it's a bit silly. Um, I'm fine. I'm very good. I was just uh, saying earlier that I realised that um, menstruation doesn't, doesn't stop for um for the lockdown so it was really useful to realize that and um share that with everyone in the entire world and the future <laughs> But it is, it is interesting, as, as you were saying, that idea that we do almost think that everything, everything the, the biology will be different. Biology will stop. All normal biology will will stop. For everything else is now pandemic biology. And I, I was saying last night, but in late in the evening, I suddenly just started to feel really, really frustrated and kind of just that kind of hint of of, 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 of depression and, and, and annoyance. And I thought, all right, that's the first hit now of this. Lot. And then I went, oh, no, it's not. That also happens when I'm on tour. That happens sometimes when I'm walking down the high street. That happens. These are just, you know, and, and I think sometimes we have to take care to look at some of our moods and think this may well not be something that is trapped within the current scenario. It is merely the, you know, the lulls and the highs that uh, we have um, in in the rest of life. Too. Um, wherever you don't go, there you still are. <laughs> What, um, what is your show and tell today? Oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention, sorry, good, uh, just something to uh, last night when I thought, right, I will drag myself out of any kind of silly mire that I'm placing myself in. And I suddenly remembered, uh, well, I was getting annoyed at various people who, uh, we talked about this yesterday, but but the way that certainly kind of some older people are being talked about at the moment and, and, and the respect for them. And uh, Jane Goodall put up something wonderful. I adore Jane Goodall. I mean, what incredible work she uh, has done in, in terms of understanding chimpanzees and, and continue mm. to travel the world and just you know and and, and with such a great a, a message for us all and uh, and I and that then got me to watching the young at heart chorus uh, you know oh. the young, oh man there is a version of them with a uh, also a children's choir in Chicago doing the Pixies where is my mind which oh, that's just, unbearable I'll cry just thinking about oh, it oh, oh. It's a delight. And there is, if you've not seen the Young at Heart movie as well, this is a, a choir of, of octogenarians and nonagenarians, and they, they sing songs by so many different, you know, and it is Talking Heads and it is sometimes The Clash and it is uh, Sonic Youth. And it's great. And there's this beautiful moment in, 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 in during the film, of course, because they are a very old choir, there are people who 
become ill and and there are moments where in, in fact there's a, cu- a couple of the choir members die but one of the choir members that through a lot of film we think is going to die suddenly just rallies around and makes a full recovery and there's this beautiful sequence where the choir master goes uh now great news jeff uh, jeff's much better actually now and uh he should be out very soon and i know some of you have nearly died as well and they kind of go <laughs> it goes uh jack you nearly died didn't you i did nearly die oh so i did not enjoy nearly dying at all uh, beth you nearly died didn't you i did i did and then he goes uh now um uh, uh, sybil you did die didn't you didn't you? And, and she goes yes i did i was dead <laughs> for two minutes and he says did you see the light and she says i didn't look and i just love that. i think that is such a beautiful um doesn't thing. count if you don't look if you don't I, look I, they can't get you you gotta go back yep. <laughs> so what's what is show and tell this morning this is my, my show and tell i bought um last week because on the advice of my agent that i'd be able to do some voiceover work i bought myself a very beautiful microphone uh from the internet and I love it I thought it was beautiful and then I got it home and I unpacked it well I say I got it home it came to my home and I unpacked it and I looked and I realized it plugs into a USB port which my laptop doesn't have so I have this lovely ornament to remind me of what it means to broadcast and I can put it up on a shelf and do nothing else with it Um, but luckily my boyfriend's one does have so he doesn't get to watch any old cricket matches anymore (laughs) I love that madness, though, that for now, years on end, you just sit there with your microphone, broadcasting to no one there. The crazy (laughs) whore-whore that she became. But the, um, hang on, the recording's going going on, but the USB port isn't docked. (laughs) Docked? I mean, I'm saying this like I know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. What's your show and tell item, Robin? Um, I was also going to say, by the way, because you say about your voiceover work, and I mentioned it last week, but I mentioned it again, Shortcuts, which is Josie's magnificent show on on Radio 4. The one that was last week with uh, Terry Jones talking about Dylan Thomas is an absolute joy. And again, if you want to, uh, it's recorded in 2014, if if you want something delightful and and humane to listen to uh, this afternoon, go and find uh, Josie's Shortcuts. Um, This is is a £5 coin. Um, which is in my kind of uh, jar of strange coins. And the reason I've got this is uh, when I was doing the free fringe a few years ago, uh, uh, we talk about the fact the fringe isn't this year, but a few years ago, I suddenly realized I was always playing these kind of venues where it was quite expensive to get in and stuff like that. And I felt under so much pressure and I was so kind of, uh, um, you know, worried all the time. That I didn't think I was performing probably at my best. And so I started just do the free fringe instead. And, um, it's so nice because as opposed to sitting on the show at the assembly going la, 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 so worried about what everyone thinks, you're standing with a bucket and you're chatting to people and some of them are putting money in and you're saying, don't give me any money if you haven't got anything, that's fine. And someone pulled out this and they said, I've had this five pound coin for about seven years and I really enjoyed that show and I think you should have my five pound coin. So I just want to check because it's a very beautiful thing, the free fringe, where you have this connection, a very, very different kind of connection with, with, with the audience, I think, and, and, and that immediate conversation afterwards. So I can't remember who you were. Um, and this was about, you know, 10 years ago. But thank you very much. I keep this five pound coin. One day I'll go and see a free fringe show and I'll go, do you know what? It's time to pass it on. So that's my show and tell. Oh, that's um, nice. Also, it makes me think I have so many little mementos from the past sort of 20 years of performing that have come from various people in the audiences. And again, like, I feel awful about the fact that I keep the thing and remember it and remember the person, but don't know who the person was in most of the instances. Um, So just have this strange little archive that no one else knows about. Um, who, Who are we speaking to first, Robin? Well, this oh, is interesting because we've been joined by Katie now. Hello. But we Hi. did say we were changing the order, but I will see you. I will see you. Probably can't the audience see this. Probably can't see this. Are you Katie? okay if we go to Katie first and then come to you? Is that all right with you? Uh, Brilliant. Yeah, Sorry, oh. I don't. I don't know what went wrong here. I had some technical difficulties. Oh, don't worry. That's fine. You're here. And I was worried that I wouldn't join and some diamond earrings. Um, because I think this is possibly how Joan Collins is handling self-isolation. <laughs> and I just want to, I feel like she above all would cope. She's seen a lot. So I thought I'd, uh, I, I was disappointed I might not be able to join you because I, this is, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be wearing my turban. Well, I think <laughs> as far as I know, we now, we just, now drop, just drop out for the next 20 minutes and you're doing your one woman version of Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> this is, uh, that is perfect. This is um, my close up. 
<laughs> Were you ready? Were you ready? <laughs> such a great movie. I've gone I've mad. Been. I've already gone mad. Oh, but it's such a short journey, isn't it? If you started off from, from the places where we all started off. From. That's true. That's okay. yes. um, it's just a very short, ambling, short gov- ambling, <laughs> government mandated walk. That's all it is. I said I'd never again, and here I am, seven days. <laughs> and uh, how, how very impressive you've dressed up. Thank you. I am too. I was. I, I've dressed up more for this than my own wedding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how are you finding, finding this? This, this uh, because of course, I mean, I sh- we should say that you had a, you know, that that kind of uh, the, the a reasonably brutal social media discovery of the fact that, yes. you, that you you were meant to be in the West End at the moment in everyone's uh, talking about Jamie, weren't you? Yes, so, I, so, so, I got so a I... job in January to do four months, and everybody's talking about Jamie. It's the first time I've ever gone in for anything for the West End really and um I, but I really wanted to as a teenager I mean I can't believe I achieved this and managed to pull this off got booked for four months I managed two weeks on stage and then we were cancelled oh, and now here God. we are but I got my two weeks I got my two weeks but I um but yes it all happened so fast because I got a message in the afternoon saying we, we're not shutting down we're just going to keep going. No one's quite sure. This was two weeks ago, so that feels like a lifetime ago when people still weren't quite sure whether we were supposed to be staying in. Yeah. Um, and people were coming to the show as they always do and loving it, and it was all great. But we kept sort of thinking, is this really? I mean, this feels mad. But we were carried on, and I said, oh, we carry on. They said yes. And then an hour and a half later, I saw on Twitter all the shows were cancelled. Uh, as a result of Boris effectively telling everyone not to come to the theatre um, but he did that before he instructed theatres to shut down so he effectively told a load of businesses as I'm sure we all know that none of your customers should come but you should sort of carry on if you want to um, but that's impossible so the, yes about it was cancelled about an hour before we went on stage uh, and that was how I found out that I didn't have a job anymore. Although I've got some other writing stuff, so I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, I, I don't know if we'll come back. No one really knows what will happen. But I'm glad I got my glittering fortnight uh, in the West End. <laughs> no one can take that away from me now. How, how are you finding the adrenaline? Because, I mean, that's what we've talked with a few performers where I think anyone, when they take a bit of a break, after the first three days, you kind of maybe frying eggs at seven in the evening. And you suddenly notice you're frying them in a slight, you know, <laughs> the adrenaline's beginning to get there. How, how are you kind of finding that at the moment? Yeah, that was weird because I, I used to, I, for all last year, I wrote a book. And so I was sort of going to bed at 9 p.m. and living this very ascetic, virtuous life and getting up and sort of seeing my child off to kindergarten and writing and then stopping at about three and then do, cooking dinner and all this. And then I had to lurch myself back into this massive adrenalized moment of starting work at 7.30 p.m. and finishing at half past 10 and all of that. So I kind of really pushed to do all that and I changed my whole body clock just in time to then be back in a position where I need to go back to bed at 9 p.m. So I, like, I'm feeling quite annoyed. Um, but it does mean I'm cracking through the old Hilary Mantel. So, you know, <laughs> I've, got my, I've got late hours in the day to press on with that. I sit around feeling like Thomas Cromwell like plotting my little ways back and trying to figure out how I'm going to deal with this situation. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of dealing with it by reading mainly. But I've been writing this book about Mary Poppins as a follow-up to the book I wrote last year about Dirty Dancing. And I am discovering, this is going to sound like some dreadful cynical marketing, but it really isn't. (laughs) Like I am discovering Mary Poppins is the ideal tonic for this situation so I've actually found it quite comforting spending my days writing about Mary Poppins because she's all about being practical and stoical and tidying up I mean my house has never been so clean we, we basically deep clean it every 12 hours in a way that we used to do twice a year if we were lucky so the Mary Poppins thing is keeping me going so I'm very grateful for that and I'm grateful for the work otherwise I would have gone completely nuts and it'd be a lot more than a turban I'm now <laughs> I'm, I'm now, now that I'm Gloria Swanson playing Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> this is a fascinating game of of, of, of misfits. The um, I'm available. I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will quickly mention just because you were talking about that that uh, the, we we have a kind of tip jar at the bottom of the, of, oh, yeah. of, of this, and uh, some of us are fortunate. Some some performers are fortunate because we have got other things that we can do. As as uh, as Katie was just just saying, um, and I have heard some people going, "Oh, but all performers have this." Actually, a lot of other performers don't. A lot of performers and a lot of kind of 
of uh, the comics that we know, people like that, that every week is just playing some of the small clubs, making some yeah. money, and that's how they survive. So what we're doing is we're, we're collecting money to try and make sure we've got resource for those people who are going to hit the wall with this. And also to try and make sure that some of the smaller art centres that we play in some of the small towns, stuff like that, again, which are going to struggle, which are not just there for the evening. Uh, they are very often places where people go during the day and there are things that keep the whole community going. And, and so also there are things which there were, are things which were uh, already struggling. They are things which were already struggling for funding and which were already kind of eking out the funding they had. So something like this is, is just enough to kind of make things even more difficult. So anything we can do would be really useful. Got a show and tell? Yes. Here I've got, I've got I, just, I don't know if you'll be able to see these, two figures. Can you see these? Yeah. Ah. Woo. So why do you are, have these in your terrible house? <laughs> these are um, <laughs> two uh, Dutch pottery figures that my grandma had when I was a kid. Smash them! And I don't know if you can see <laughs> them. No, How, well, this, this is this is my origin story, Joseph. For God's sake! Uh, no, these aren't my grandparents. <laughs> my, um, I um, and. Uh, I didn't know anything about them, but I used to play with them a lot as a child. And my grandparents travelled the world. So my granddad was a brass band conductor and my grandma was a teacher. And um, they would often be given gifts by visiting bands that they went to. So I think this came from a Danish brass band and was a yeah. gift to my grandparents. But I always really liked their expressions. He, uh, it, they very much uphold the patriarchy. He is cheeky and sort of a bit drunk and she's his angry wife looking at him angrily. And I used to love playing with these and I played with them as a kid and made up loads of stories about these two. I think they're brandy holders. They've got corks in their heads. Uh, and when my grandma went to a care home a couple of years ago, um, we sort of were able to take some of the things that we liked. So I got these two. Um, and uh, yeah, they are quite odd. I've tried to look up a bit about them. I know they're from the Soholm pot Pottery in Denmark, and I don't know how old they are. Um, but yeah, they were they were some of the earliest things that I tried to make up stories about because I just like their faces. So that's my show and tell. That's lovely. Also, they really also lend they really lend themselves to that. Like they've got very interesting um, nursery rhymic faces. Yeah, nursery rhymic feels they like they do real, so. in that kind of Scandinavian, slightly horrifying. She's quite terrifyingly uplit, actually. That's beautiful. Oh, that's nice. Josie, it's the perfect time for you to do your sitcom wife from 1986. Yes. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> stop enjoying yourself. <laughs> Excellent. But basically, the whole part is always just Michael, grow yeah. up. I've always uh, I've auditioned for about four hundred of those. Uh, I never got them. I started always. getting. I started getting auditions for mums in things, and I'm so and I'm so excited. And then I always read it, and it's like her son is 15 years old. And I'm like, <laughs> I couldn't have had the baby when I was 21. I couldn't have had the baby when I was 21. <laughs> but Still, yet, somehow the line is, Michael, when will you grow up? No matter what you play, no matter what. <laughs> the mum, the girlfriend, come on, when are we going to have kids? Why do you keep going out with your best mate? Yeah. Do you find though now are the more because you know does, looking you know, out there the, the do seem to be more proper interesting you know you think of uh, whether it's things like Lady Dynamite or whether it's you know the the kind of the the magnificent performances by people like you know Greta Gerwig who who you know before doing directing fantastic in France's hand and uh, um, is it is it Mistress America I'm trying to remember the actual name of that but but are the more do you now go oh this is actually this is a comedy character this is a real or is is that an illusion for for me watching for me watching uh, um no i think there are there are more high profile female led shows like there's a good handful that have just got i mean we know what they are and they've won every award in the world and deservedly but what there isn't is that kind of middle level of constant employment for people who aren't necessarily the star of the show or the writer of the show but just if you look at if you watch tv you'll see that if you count up the parts of these of the stars, there's probably a good, really good representation of big stars. But there's about room for about five of those. But what is the next layer down is just constant employment for percent of the other parts will be for the men. So it's more to do with just keeping uh, all 
layers, not just the superstars, but at all layers keeping the representation. And it's the same with BAME actors and everything. You don't just want that one. It's just it should pepper it all. It should just be a sort of melee in the middle. So um, I think it's changing at the top, definitely, right at the top. But the top's a sort of narrow platform to sit on. I'd like to see more of the pyramid uh, di diversify better as well because that, that's more employment for lots of people so people can stay in the game get better then maybe make their own shows and then you know that's 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 uh, that's the next thing I think I don't know that's what cool. do you guys think yeah I mean that, yeah I mean that that sounds really true and also uh, it's nice to feel like that makes sense and it would feel very good if that were the next thing to happen like if that were to come slightly more to fruition I think then all tv shows would become more realistic you'd be yeah. like oh yeah look that's what real life looks like that's the yeah yeah well we'll, we'll come back uh, to you Katie but we're now going to go over to uh Mr John Hegley good morning John Hegley. good morning John morning good morning Robin um good morning how uh how are you down to a, 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 a structure to your day or a change in the structure of your day since uh, the, the, the lockdown has, has begun? Well, there's certain things I try to do each day. Some tidying, some tidying, some French, um, and, and some reading, and also reading out on the phone. I've been doing poems to friends on the phone, and that's been really And they've been reading them to me, and that's been really fantastic, actually. Not oh, my that's poems, lovely. Or, discovered poems. And um, I read uh, my friend Alison yesterday, actually, I was doing it with, and we hadn't, neither of us had prepared the poems, and we were just pulling books down off the shelf and saying, give us a page number. Huh. Lovely. <laughs> the, uh, one of, I was just suddenly, that reminded me of one of my, my favourite moments of you uh, working with someone else, was when we were on Loose Ends together, quite a few years back now, and you had you were doing your uh, song Grand Mère about your 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 French grandmother, and Martha Reeve of Martha Reeve and the Vandellas was on as well, and you got her. Who, she was a wonderful human, and is a wonderful. I mean, does so much activism as well. And she joined and made created this duet. And I remember just standing in the pub afterwards, and we both had that look of going, "Isn't it amazing?" Sometimes the things that can happen. There was Martha Reeve, Motown legend, duetting yeah. on that. Yeah. Because that was, I was thinking, in one of your, um, you, you wrote an essay, a, a story a, a, a while ago for a book about comedy. And you talked about that moment where, I think you, you did a gig at the, it was uh, down at the South Bank Centre. Um, and it was a poetry night. And you and I remember you saying that it, it was the first night where you went and sat in a, in a pub afterwards in, uh, in Finsbury Park. And you thought, tonight I was a real poet. And it was like, you know, not just on the comedy. Set. And that, how do you feel about that, that balance now, many years on? Um, it was, yeah, it was interesting. I, I remember that, Robin. It was actually the Bull and Gate it was, I think, um, that well, I went to afterwards and taught that. Um, it's, it's, it's lovely to have things to balance and sometimes to see how things cross over and sometimes how a poem welcomes comedy uh like, like a little, yeah there's something that crossing over can sometimes be such a lovely thing and i was wondering where um just because I, I watched something you did recently uh, you, you did a, a, a piece channel. on the team uh where they had various different people went in and they taught a class for a day and i watched your one which was an absolute mm. delight and I, i'm thinking now that a lot of people are they weren't expecting that they were going to become homeschoolers and a lot of people are now kind of homeschooling and yeah. uh and I want you know, from, from from your experience there, and of course, also you you know you have a child as well. Well, uh, grown up now, I know. But uh, um, and I wondered, you know, any advice that you have in terms of that moment sometimes where we do hit walls when we're trying to kind of have those educational moments with our kids. Yes, Robin. Yes, Robin. Um, because I thought of that in the poem. Okay, so the poem you asked me about doing a poem. So I thought I'd choose a poem that people can go and do the, uh, their version of. Robin? Yeah. Oh, I just wondered if you could hear me. <laughs> hear me? <laughs> no, we're just both, like, <laughs> sort of wrapped. Okay. So this is called The Differences Between Dogs and Deck Chairs. Hmm. A deck chair doesn't beg or cock up its leg. Deck chairs don't sniff each other. Deck chairs can't swallow or swim or growl. Deck chairs aren't her or him. Deck chairs don't join in games with sticks. There are no prizes for well-trained deck chairs. Deck chairs rarely have names except deck chair. 
<laughs> People don't have trouble putting up a dog. Dog's legs don't have little notches in. A deck chair's legs are much stiffer with no knees. A dog is, is better at running after frisbees. Deck chairs can be stacked quite neatly. Dogs have more hairs. Deck chairs have more letters. Deck chairs don't sniff about in autumn leaves. A deck chair receives little praise. <laughs> so I received Love from that. back school in Barrow, Robin, uh, somebody had read that, one of the teachers, and sent me some of the children's. And so here there was the difference between Lionel Messi and a cow. <laughs> Messi isn't fat. A cow doesn't speak Argentinian. Messi isn't patterned. Uh, <laughs> and then the difference between a spoon and a wolf. A spoon, a spoon never howls. You can't eat with a wolf. A spoon isn't grey. A wolf isn't shiny. A spoon isn't hairy. A wolf isn't made of metal. A spoon has got orange eyes. <laughs> so people can make their own different. You can choose to any two things, pick two things up, and make the differences between them. That's really and fun. finding this in terms of actually, you know, general creativity is is is, th is this. Are you finding this period that you are still able to focus? Because I know there's a lot of different people who have reactions, and so I've heard some people kind of going, "Don't think you have to make something," you know, because they are seeing a lot of people going out there and making stuff, and then I think they're feeling in guilty that they're not making. So you know, all of those kind of balances. How are you finding that? Um well, um, well, my brother said, oh, you can do some writing. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I said, I can do some drawing as well. No, yeah, drawing. Um, so I've done some drawing and uh, I've been writing some, I have been trying to write something each day and I've been trying to sort of make, in my tidying, I'd like to make the tidying seem as though it's a significant bit of tidying. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Are you sort of well, organising you know, sections? You've gone into a bag that you'd never, you, that you, a box that you haven't gone in, and you've sort of tried to sort of go in a bit deeper, thinking how much of this do I really need? How much? Wow! So then you're going to come out of this a streamlined man. <laughs> yeah, but I'm putting it back in and thinking, okay, well that needs looking at properly. <laughs> 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 that's what it's getting rid of do stuff. that bit where you suddenly realize the only time you've looked at an object is when you were debating about getting rid of it and then you put it back in the corner <laughs> then you went back two years later and you debated about getting rid of it and you put because i've i found i literally have thousands of and i've never properly looked through them, thousands of postcards um from like different galleries i've been to and towns i've been to and on the back of them are just written notes for what were mm. going to be shows or just and there are thousands and thousands of them and most of them make like the, the I, I just I pulled out one. This one's oh I, I showed this the other day. This is uh, on something else. This was uh, just an Edward Hopper postcard, and I've just written on the back crabs and self consciousness. Open bracket. <laughs> oh no, my claws look dowdy. Close brackets. Question mark. So somewhere <laughs> in there was going to be an exploration of the self consciousness of crabs and the fear of dowdiness, but um, that never turned into anything. anything. <laughs> Robin, what you need to do is you need to um, rent a warehouse space and you need to buy lots of very long strings and attach all the postcards to strings and make an exhibition that people can walk around and examine and call it... Well, we all it's have the to Robin think of it's archive. archive. You can't throw that away, Robin. Yeah, it's, it's very... Robin cool. archive. Yeah, Don't but I can imagine think... the moment it burnt upon, you know, he's dead, finally. <laughs> This was one that I love. I found this. This is a um, this is from uh, Dave Simpson's book, The Fallen, which is about all the different members of the fall there have been because, of course, oh, Mark wow. and, uh, and I, I just never noticed this. He must have fallen out of my copy of the book. And it just uh, says uh, for Gary Kemp, loved your book. Uh, best wishes, Dave. So obviously I've somehow ended up with uh, a member of Spandau Ballet's copy of a book about the fall. <laughs> <laughs> you've intercepted it um, John can I ask you what do you have a, have a system, system like, like Robin's? Robin's like how do you keep your ideas and keep uh, keep note of things as they come to you uh, they're sort of quite haphazardly put around and then it's sometimes nice to sort of dig in and pull things out and think oh now I can use that that feels right at the moment so they're sort of in sort of, sort of haphazard piles really um, and then you pull them out. And, so, and again, it's that thing of putting two things out. So pull one out from that pile and one out from that pile. And putting the two things together can sometimes generate something new. It's the, uh, the essence of uh, surrealism. The two. Fact, uh, I think there's some element of that, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we might not mean to, but very often we become accidental Dardarists, I think, in terms of the. Uh, um, My daughter's incredible at it. Today, today she was scribbling over the shopping list, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm into it. <laughs> Just good creative practice. <laughs> <laughs>
How old's your daughter, Josie? Um, she's going to be two in two months. Oh. Yeah, she's great. She's great fun, but she's also, uh, she just has no respect for tidiness whatsoever. No respect. <laughs> <laughs> and she, and she has, uh, she's, she's going through a real phase where wherever I am, she'd like to be, which in some ways is very lucky for her yeah. because I am always in the same house as her. But... <laughs> in other ways it does sort of make the washing up a bit difficult um and my partner as well is, is feeling it because we split the childcare. but for some reason at the moment he's just she just is absolutely furious at him she just wants me <laughs> she may well briefly appear in the corner of her head before the end of the show that, yeah. that, that does something john can i ask you just uh, under no pressure but i wondered if you had one more poem for us uh before we uh uh, well, can, I sing, can, I sing, can I sing this in advance to my show and tell? Oh, yeah, we haven't done show and tell yet. Brilliant. Yes. So this is a, this is for so this is about Poisson d'Avril, which is what in France they have a French uh, the French have a fish in, uh, in, in April that you stick on each other's back. And when I say Poisson d'Avril, will you do will you all do the the fish when I say Poisson and keep it Poisson. <laughs> Let's have a practice. And let people at home. Or poisson. <laughs> did, did you do it? Poisson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> His first years as a schoolboy were the years my father spent going off to school in Paris where the first of April meant a fish made out of paper which you didn't get to feel as it was stuck onto your jacket. Le poisson d'avril. D'Avril, D'Avril, Poisson d'Avril. The call was heard in England and across the sea he came. The revolutionised existence which was going to reveal less Poisson to start with, even less Poisson d'Avril. D'Avril, D'Avril, Zut alors ici encore, le Poisson d'Avril. Yeah! Thank you, John. And that, so, so that, that leads straight into show and tell. That's not that real. The thing is, so you can make them, and to, Josie, your two-year-old youngster, can, or nearly two-year-old, can you make them, get a bit of card, because you, can, you can't stick them on each other's back now. You can stick them on the back of your instrument or, or post them. And so this piece of card here I've got, which are called metric templates. I don't quite know what they are, but this would make a good card. There's the little, that would be the mouth. And then for the eye, you could maybe stick on um, an old battery or I found a pencil. Can you see a wood shaving for an eye? You might stick on a bit of colored stuff. You've got a good stapler like that, staple it on. Even a bit of fake <laughs> first, put that on, cut it out bit of colour, mine's in Luton colours, Luton town colours, um, <laughs> and send that to somebody or give it to somebody. That's Thank brilliant. you. That's so practical Thank you very as much, well. John. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. And John, in terms of people uh, finding your work and seeing your work at this point where they can't actually come and see you, uh, from where, where, where are the best places for them them to go? Well, I'm not, I'm not so organised at these sort of things, but this has been helpful to do this today, Robin. So thank you, and Josie. Thank you for getting me involved in this. Thank um, you so much for doing it. It's such a privilege. Thank you. Uh, really. It's, it, it, so I hope that it can sort of stim There's stuff. I know there's stuff out there on the internet. My website's got, but I haven't done any, put anything on that, but I'm going to try and do something. Uh, but this has been great to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and go, do go and find John's work. It, 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 just put the, put his name in the search engine. Find all those so and so many lovely books as well. Books, yeah, the, the books of poetry, which are accessible for so many different, you know, so many different kind of things. There's the uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of the potato book, John. What's the? I've got it downstairs. The um, um, is is it peace, love, and potatoes, or I am a potato. I am a poetator. Peace, love, and potatoes. <laughs> love and potatoes so as well, yeah. The uh, but they're uh, go go and find all those things. They're they're beautiful and wonderful. Thank you very much, John Hagley. Um, so, um, and, and a reminder again of our tip jar at the bottom, just to uh, try and keep uh, many of the kind of venues where we go and play uh, going, and many of the kind of performers that we love to watch as well, keeping uh, them going as well. And I'll, I'll check, check this out. Speaking of performers that we love to watch, <laughs> our final guest today is a fantastic comedian and podcaster and also a triple threat 
if yeah the third threat an incredible singer who does a musical which is the most fun silly wonderful night um, i have ever participated in ladies and gentlemen it's Kimmy P- 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 i don't know anything about this musical can you tell me about this can i just i i really feel like we should be praising actual west end star katie brand for her voice and not <laughs> Enthusiastic amateur, Kiri Pritchard McClay. Listen, I hear you're an amazing singer. I'm really not. My my job in the show is to be the one that can't sing, but that oh. wants to sing. I'm I'm the one who sings in the shower. That's my part. job in my show. To sing. Really? Yeah. I'm not it. it was great. I was you so were, sick. You came. What well, did you sing? A, was it quintet from um, West Side Story? Story. And my you favourite did, musical in the world. All did fi- you did all five parts uh, based on different... <laughs> yes, which was actually not possible within the time. Not possible I, within the time, I realised <laughs> to my chagrin during the performance. <laughs> <laughs> but it was magical. So what it is, um, it is basically a show where media to come down and sing their favourite musical theatre songs. We have a live band and it has a really lovely um, jeopardy to it because we're all so confident when we're doing stand-up but most of us aren't like Katie and are actual like able to do it. We are the people who wanted to be in the plays, but were never cast. So you have this amazing vulnerability and people try so hard, they make their own costumes. It's real, real school play vibes about it. Um, and also the audience sort of sing along and join in. It's very joyous. And the, the audience, I thought they would always just pick, um, cause basically the winner gets to encore with a different song and win some money for charity. I thought the audience would just do that lazy thing of always picking the famous one or the most proficient one, but they don't. They pick the person who has tried the hardest, and sometimes that means you have to sit through some real dog shit on course. (laughs) (laughs) That to me as well is the way the world should be. It should be that you only get a grade. Should be that you only get a grade for effort. Yeah, but that's the middle weeks. That's the middle weeks of Strictly Come Dancing. I like to call it the Strictly Anomaly. Anomaly. For a period in the middle of the competition, the public will simply vote over and over again for people who are trying hard. And then as it goes on, you just want to see some something a bit more glitzy. But the Strictly Anomaly, I think, is a lovely element of British public participation. Always. It's the Boaty McBoatface thing. It's the same, isn't it? We just want to sub- ask our opinion and we'll try and subvert it somehow till it goes wrong. <laughs> And you so have there is a, to make themselves an underdog. That's it. They've won. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite in terms of if you can just go up there and sing? What is your go-to uh, song? Um, as, as if I didn't have to hear myself. Um, it would be something Julie Andrews. So from maybe Sound of Music. I just I think she's so ridiculously brilliant and like. I know it's rank to say, but like really British in everything she plays, she's kind of just like that. What you would hope that Britain was, it's that kind of like graceful and helpful, and you know, like like we'll just crack on with this. She's she sounds like a pinnacle for me. I can't wait to read your Mary Poppins book. Oh, thank you. I've I've literally just sent in the first. We just draft. sent in the first draft yesterday to the publishers, so like you can have. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Oh, congratulations! It's a very different book by by the time it comes out. But yeah, hey, that's she, a big deal. Nice. Mm-hmm. Today, today you need to have a real celebratory day. You can't take the pearls yeah. off all day. No, no, this is it. I'm in <laughs> full, full all day. <laughs> um, Sorry, go on, Kitty. Kitty, what's your show, show and tell? Oh, well, I've kind of got two. Um, so I've got why I actually used when I was a kid, um, which is this. Um, so this is um, a horse's tooth that I um, found. Um, so I'm on our family farm at the moment, and I found this on... At, because what happens is my brothers are much older than me. They're seven and nine years older than me. So I became, because they moved out quite young, I became an only child pretty quickly. So I used to spend just lots of time on my own, wandering around the farm with my dog. Just like a, a very, very sad children's story, but very happy. That's, I was just about to say, that is a about to say, that is a children's TV programme that I would have watched religiously <laughs> every single day. What's amazing is like, I have a real sense of like um, nature and seasons and it all comes from being on my own on a farm for years and years. And one of the things that one of my best finds was on top of a molehill um, was this horse's tooth. So 
horses can lose their teeth, particularly baby teeth. Um, but you, you see, they, they grind them down at weird angles. Mm. And so that's it worn down there. And if you look closely, it looks like a collection of kind of normal teeth. But um, this would have been, I think, one towards the back, because what you have to do with horses um, is you have to get their teeth filed um, because they don't wear them down evenly. And, and this is like a spike. So that will cause damage so i don't know it not very often it's only happened about like i don't know once every couple of years maybe um a, a dent horse dentist comes and he takes the horse's tongue and he pulls it out into the side and this huge giant file almost like something almost like what you would use to get dead skin off feet goes in their mouth and they don't they don't throw their heads around it's not painful. i can't bear it <laughs> and the noise is really like it's really <laughs> <laughs> the saddest part of this is it's ruining this. this is it's ruining the song my lovely horse for me <laughs> <laughs> where it says and i'll take you to the horse dentist and i always imagined that was just kind of a gentle spruce <laughs> No, it's quite, it's really, it's a very strong, with one strong arm into a horse's mouth. But they're very chill about it. It's like when the farrier comes and they clip the feet. Um, and so, so you know, they trim the feet. But what happens is, because we grew up on, my dad was um, worked for a charity that used to rescue donkeys and things like that. So we had waifs and strays here. My mum was a riding instructor for um, riding for the disabled. So we always had horses and donkeys and, and Shetlands around. And... Um, and uh, yeah, so my, when the farrier came, um, the dogs come round because they they love nothing more than eating like these toenails that have come off the horse. <laughs> and, and they're really like they're all sort of like any minute now I'm going to get that one, and it's quite disgusting. But also, I really oh, like God. the shoe being burnt onto the onto the hoof. It smells lovely. It's, are, it's, you black, it's are you black, glad to be back? Is it nice to be back, Kiri? It's amazing to be back. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm probably the happiest person about this quarantine. Like I, I'm made because <laughs> I'm like back in the countryside with my surrounded by animals and and things. So I'm having a lovely time. Yeah, <laughs> it is the big divide, isn't it? Big divide, what, isn't it? Because what watching uh, Katie and Josie's uh, reactions. Whereas I'm the same as you because I was one of those children that I was brought up in the countryside. You go through an old ploughed field and you find a fox's skull and you go brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Want to find a badger skull because they've got a proper hinged jaw. <laughs> and we did one day. What a magnificent day of skull finding <laughs> that was. <laughs> Oh, yeah, anything like that, bones, and, like, you know, uh, yeah, you find a dead sheep like three fields away and then you keep checking back till the skull was good enough so you could take it home and boil it and then it comes up really white, yeah. Good. <laughs> Once and did these the things have magical properties for you? Um, did yeah. You, did you think you were a witch? Because I um, used to, when I was a kid, I always thought, I kid, I always thought this, I was always trying to cast spells and revenge and all all sorts of things what did did i mean you had you sounds like you had the tools to really become yeah. quite a proficient absolutely witch. in fact this tooth is um it caused the coronavirus i just wanted some time off whoa so this, yeah <laughs> sorry guys now i can't wait to see what your next show and your next show and tell is uh, I can imagine you now taking the camera into the freezer the walk-in freezer <laughs> <laughs> this one's live. Um, so this is um, this Here is my key. Oh, um, he's very cute. Hello, uh, he's very thick as well. Um, he's very, the most stupid dog I've ever owned. Um, <laughs> now, why he's special is he is a cardigan corgi, and he's about seven years old. And about ten years ago, there was only about twenty pups born into the UK. Now, my family is from Cardiganshire. The, the Welsh side of my family is from Cardiganshire in Wales, and there was no breeding dogs in the county. They, and they're working dogs; they're cattle dogs. They've been uh, sort of eradicated. So my um, my now late uncle started breeding them back into the county as working dogs. And I had seen one because um, it, it's not the ones the Queen has. They're, they're, these ones are mad looking. They're bigger. They've got like a tail like a fox. They've got these huge ears. They, they look like other dogs Frankenstein together. And um, I really wanted one, especially in those colours. Um, and uh, when I was ready to get one, I was sort of looking around the internet and um, I said to my dad, listen, when my uncle phones, tell him I really want a pup. I want one of his dogs. And then he was like, right, okay. But my father is very curmudgeonly, very tight Welshman. So he's like, oh, um, my brother phoned me the other day about one of those dogs. And I was like, right, okay. And I was like, how much does he want for it? Um, and he, he sent him out and he went, so I bloody hung up on him. And I was like, dad, that's 300 pounds cheaper than anywhere else is asking. I was like, what's his number? And he's like, I haven't written it down. 
So that was just gone, that opportunity to have that possibility. <laughs> And so then I found this other dog and I went to visit the puppies and it was it was great and I was like, okay, this is the one. It had like one little blue eye. I wanted one with one blue eye. Um, and then um, I, it was sort of, I think the puppy got ill so it was a little bit longer. And then in the meantime, I was on, um, uh, what's it called, Gumtree. And that, there was this, in Cardiganshire, there was a puppy um, being held up that was like his colours with two blue eyes and it was a little boy, which is what I wanted, and no one else would have him. So I was like, if this is three weeks old, someone will have had him. So I phoned up, and I was like, I don't suppose that puppy's still there. And they were like, yeah, we can't get rid of him. So I was like, right, I'm just going to buy it. I, I, I'll, I'll be there on Saturday. And so we drove down and got our lovely dog, P. And while I was chatting to him, I was like, uh, he was like, oh, yeah, he's, he's bred in Cardiganshire. And I was like, um, is, is the guy who bred him, is his name Raymond? And he was like, yeah. I was like, oh, so it's my uncle. So I <laughs> was always meant to have that my father hung up the phone. Um, oh. he's, a, he's the best thing in my life. He's so, ad- yes, you. He's really adorable and really stupid. It's, it's embarrassing how, quite how thick he is. But he's been he's been a great tonic to have around because um, you've got something to get up for. And yeah, when you've had sad times, he's just always there. He's brilliant. Oh, I, I love that. That that companionship that, that, that is companionship is is such a uh, someone I know when 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 their their wife died and and the the vicar said you can bring the your your dog into the church and just having that you know that that it, it's it's a very uh, for anyone who doesn't have that it's 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 like so many things it cannot be explained can it that yeah. sense of, of 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 companionship at that time. Also, I think this period it's is really, really really getting people. Uh, to become sure about the things that they want in the future because I'm fixating on the fact that I'm moving to Scotland, I'm moving to Scotland. And then my, my other friend is looking at the same advert for one rescue dog over and over again every day <laughs> and just imagining her life with him and just every day like, I'm coming for you. I don't know when, but I'm coming for you. <laughs> and I just think it's so sweet that like, yeah, it's putting a lot of good things into focus in terms of ways that we might go in the future. Definitely. I'm still fixating on finishing that rocket ship that I'm going to fly to the event horizon of a black hole. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I'm working on it. Um, you can do it, Robin. You it's it. just, just the lockdown holding you back, Robin. Yeah. We better, better wind, wind up. up now. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, John, and thank you, Katie, and thank you, Kiri. Thank and, you. Uh, um, and also, I was going to, this is a separate thing to everything else we've been talking about with the tip jar and stuff, but something I was trying to get going yesterday for anyone who's on kind of Twitter and social media is uh, the big issue at the moment is obviously. Obviously, it's, it's a huge problem for the fact that all the vendors can't actually go and sell. And uh, so trying to uh, get more and more people to subscribe to the big issue during this period. And also, we're trying to collect as many as possible short films. If you are able to film yourself very quickly with a message for the big issue, for maybe your favourite vendor, maybe someone you buy it off all the time, or maybe just about the first time you saw it, then uh, um, please go and uh, and just make a little thing, pop it up, and we're going to edit them all together and, um, and put them on the big issue uh, um, site. There's one one more thing we need to remind people of, which is tonight at half past eight, there is a live as part of our festival recording of the Off Menu podcast, which is so much fun. It's James Acaster and Ed Gamble present it together. And the guest today is Richard Herring. It'll be great. It will be so much fun. Um, I really recommend it. If I can stay up late enough, I'm going to watch it. (laughs) But who knows? My day began at 10 to 7 with a lot of activities. (laughs) (laughs) And And, uh, uh, tomorrow morning we're joined by... Uh, the creator of one of my favourite TV shows of all time, Rhys Shearsmith. It's so uh, exciting. Inside number nine. So, uh, and then in the evening we have uh, we're also doing an evening show with Katie Mack, who has written a brilliant book about the end of the universe, and also um, Lem Cisse as well is, is going to be there. So, thank you. Uh, oh. But, oh, also Nikesh Shukla is on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, tomorrow morning too. Oh, so, that'll be fun. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Find out everyone is watching about all of these people's work. They are all worth supporting. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>